Hi. Thank you all for joining us for our first virtual Nancy G. Unovsky Visiting Artist Lecture, which allows us to include those of you tuning in from New York, Connecticut, Tennessee, California, and beyond. I'm Alex Epstein, and I'm the Director of Exhibitions and Curator at Goucher College, as well as a Studio Art Alumni Class of 2007. We are thrilled to have, as this entire calendar year's guest, Ajay Kurian, who wrote out the question marks of our new reality with us since his original lecture date back in the spring. We are grateful for his patience and commitment to presenting Polyphemus, his beautiful solo exhibition in the Silver Gallery, which is on view through December 4th. Goucher senior Naomi Bergiorgi Van Pelt will introduce Ajay in a moment, but first I'd like to thank everyone who helped to make this lecture possible. First and foremost, thank you to Nancy Yunovsky, who continues to generously support contemporary art on campus. She's created this annual opportunity for our students to meet and work with renowned artists in the classroom, in one-on-one -on -one studio visits, and via their public artist talk. Her support makes this all possible. Thanks to my colleagues who helped to coordinate the various behind the scenes aspects of Ajay's visit, especially Paige Pate, Rick Delaney, John Pirelli, Ryan Glazer, and Alan Massey. And thanks to Angie McDonald and Carrie Brandon who would have helped to run this event in person if we were able to do so. Thank you to Goucher's administration and studio art faculty for their support of Ajay's exhibition and programming, allowing the public onto our closed campus by appointment to view the exhibition. If you have not yet done so and would like to make an appointment, please email me at alex.epstein at goucher.edu or send us a direct message on Instagram where you can find us at Goucher Art Galleries. Uh, this evening, we ask that you mute your mics and feel free to turn off your cameras during Ajay's talk. We will open up for a Q&A at the end and use the raise hand function under participants and the host will unmute uh, attendees so they can ask their questions. You can also direct questions to me uh, via the chat in, if you would prefer to have your questions read out loud for you. I'd now like to introduce Naomi Bergiorgi Van Pelt, who will introduce Ajay. Thank you, Alex. Ajay Kurian was born in 1984 in Baltimore and lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. He was Sorry about that. Can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Great. <laughs> I'm gonna start over. Ajay Kurian was born in 1984 in Baltimore and lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. He received his BA in art and art history at Columbia University in 2006. His work looks to manifest the contradictions of history, culture, and materiality through various sculptural ecologies where no singular approach is prioritized. At the heart of his practice is the desire to explore what it means to be human today and how we might think of the humanist project differently. He has had solo exhibitions at 47 Canal in New York, Cease and Hoka in Dusseldorf, White Flag Projects in St. Louis, Missouri, Javeri Contemporary in Mumbai, and Audiovisuals in New York. He has exhibited work in internationally in group exhibitions at K11 Art Foundation in Hong Kong, the 2017 Whitney Biennial, the Au Regard Museum in Copenhagen, La Panacee in Montpellier, France, the Art Commissions on Governors Island in New York, New York, MoMA PS1 also in New York, and the Frida Sienum in Kassel, among others. His work is included in public collections, including the Aishti Foundation Collection in Beirut, Lebanon, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. Please welcome Ajay Kurian. Hi. Um, sorry, I'm just getting accustomed to um, all of this. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Anybody? Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I'm just going to get right into it. I want to thank Alex Epstein and Naomi for those introductions. Um, I want to thank everybody at Goucher for uh, helping me with this exhibition and um, yeah, just for the opportunity to to put this up and then also to, to give this talk, which um, is new for me. So I'm 
bear with me a little bit. I have like more written out than I normally would. I tend to um, just have some notes when I'm doing this in person, but for some reason or another, I feel uh, like I need, I need more right now. Um, with that, I'm going to, basically the way I wanna structure this is I'm gonna share two exhibitions um, that were back to back. It's the exhibition that's currently up at uh, the Silver Art Gallery at Goucher. Um, and then my, uh, the immediately prior exhibition that I had at my German gallery, Seasonhoka, which was entitled Possessions. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just kind of run through the images of both of those exhibitions and then we'll go back and I'll talk about uh, both of them, Polyphemus a little bit more at length and uh, end on why, basically how I could, how I could make two exhibitions that look very different, um, but have, uh, I think, some connective tissue. Okay, so. This is a video of my show, which I think will get things started. So this is the entrance to the exhibition. Um, it was very hard to photograph. And even just as difficult to take video of. The three central components in the show are these inlaid vitrines in the walls. And there's kind of like a sort of a loose narrative to it. These globes are made out of melted gummy bears. I'll give a little bit of overview. These are, the vitrines are almost like episodes. Um, you can think of them kind of like uh, Dante's Inferno, um, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. So it's like stages out of hell, sort of. <laughs> This piece is called Who Has Who. And again, I'm gonna discuss all of this at further length. I'm just kind of letting you watch the video right now. That was a collaborative piece between me and Raphael Lyon on the wall there. And this is called Comfort Zone, Holy Nina's Garden. If you're familiar with the parable of the sower by Octavia Butler, the main character's name is Olenina. It's so strange talking to like complete and utter silence. Okay, so let's stop that share and I'm going to share, I'm gonna go through the images of uh, the show Goucher, there we go. So this is Polyphemus for those of you who haven't seen it, which I am assuming is maybe all of you except uh, Alex. <laughs> um, the space is quite large and the ceilings are incredibly high. And so that was something that I was considering from the very start, um, how to deal with a space like this and like what, that, uh, what that's gonna look like. Um, Polyphemus is the name of the Cyclops from uh, Homer's The Odyssey. And as you can see, there are a lot of one-eyed uh, figures in the show. This is the only one that isn't, that frog. Even in the back, the monkey that's grinning has, uh, of course he has two eyes, but he's forcibly blinking, so he has one eye as well. 
And this is the central piece here called the citizens. Now, basically what I wanna bring your attention to in going from that video to this is that obviously these are very, very different exhibitions. Um, there are some things that connect them in terms of like setting mood and tone and like an emotional atmosphere of light. Um, but I just wanted to see, I wanted to show you that there's kind of, that there's sort of a range in what I do and, and, um, and kind of how I approach projects. Like, you know, when people ask you sort of the basic question, like, oh, what do you do? And you say, I'm an artist. The, the first question is like, what kind of art do you make? And I, it's very difficult for me to answer that question because it kind of changes so dramatically from project to project. Um, this piece on the table here uh, that looks kind of like a board game is uh, actually a replica of Alberto Giacometti's No More Play. Um, it obviously doesn't look like a normal Giacometti. There's um, you know, thin figures here. But um, it's a lesser known work and it's something that I really wanted to include. It's kind of a last minute change. Um, this coaster here is also like for those who watched The Watchmen, that is the, um, the symbol of the, you know, sort of the, the Neo KKK, the Cyclops in, in The Watchmen. Figure here. Um, and we'll go to the fans in a second. This piece, um, the head rotates 360 degrees. Um, I don't have a video of that up right now, but um, yeah, so there's there's that added element that kind of gives it a, a bit of an exorcist vibe as well. and then the fans above, um, all of which, you know, uh, at one point or another will, will die and then they'll just be these kind of stable works. But in the meantime, the smile that illuminates them um, bounces all around um, because of the wind that's blowing and also because of that, the shadows behind them dramatically change over time. So I want to go back now to uh, this first show. Uh, right exit this. Okay. okay, so I'm going to read you the press release, which is very short. It's the poem that I wrote for the show, and we're going to talk about that. The world is filled with buds and blooms of dreams and griefs so pungent. They grew from bone and misery, the learned bid incumbent. Yet lifted well past mud and gut, our glassy beings, still and blind. They circle in a single ring, their hearts composed of stones refined. In every age they take a stone, their soul in dear possession, then press it close and slowly home the ages rock confession. And as they look on all that is, they ask each age a question. Its simpleness belies its breath and brevity, deception. Who has who? A celestial peal, a chime heard years before Abram, yet always asked with youthful zeal to name the new relation. A whisper to the single soul, distraught with love and fear, grasping for a sturdy role on land once solid, now unclear. And on to ask the world at large, possessions planetary, convinced for years our will took charge, we named the estuary. Yet names and tools do not suffice to tame the world's momentum. As oceans rise and drown our vice, our rains reduce to phantoms. Again, the skybound being plead, skybound beings plead, their insistence firm yet patient. Their state concedes no want or need, instead disperse ablation. 
The dirt itself is temporary and stars have no affections, but life still seeks a greater host and bears new curled connections. So this show, um, as, as the story goes, um, Alex asked me to do this show uh, last year in June. So that was a year and four months ago. Um, and that was six months after I had gotten out of a 10 year relationship. And um, I was fine at that point, but I had no, like, I didn't know what I was going to be. I didn't know what I was making. I, didn't, I wasn't going to the studio at all. And I didn't really have a sense of whether I was even capable of it for a while. And so when she asked me, um, there was a part of me that was like, I don't know if I'm making things anymore. And so I turned it down then because I just couldn't do it. Uh, but then it kind of came back around. And in the meantime, I realized that I did have another show in me, which uh, this is the result of that. Possessions is, uh, it was my way of thinking through a lot of things that I was going through at the time, but also like, obviously it's not uh, to sort of create this diaristic impression. Um, in a sense, it's like the one thing, I remember when I was having studio visits at the time, the one thing that I wouldn't say is basically, um, it's a breakup show about climate change uh, because that sounds like the most ridiculous show possible. But that's kind of where like my head was at. Um, thinking about personal tragedy or personal catastrophe um, and what uh, global catastrophe kind of uh, means alongside that. In a way, I feel like a lot of my work starts with the personal and then is woven into histories and woven into uh, larger conceptions of the world because um, I'm obviously a part of it. So uh, I'd be divorced from those happenings. And, that usually takes time and it usually takes um, some processing. This piece is called um, Blood Moon or Memory of the Bees. There's a silicone eel at the very bottom there and it's just dirt from my studio and some water. Um, the gallery was very confused about why I wanted to show this and especially to have it in the front of the show. But I, I needed something that was kind of like messed up to start the show. So as I was saying, um, the first piece, let's see, you know, this was, this piece is called Comfort Zone Symposium on Disconnection. All of the pieces are called Comfort Zone and um, then they have parenthetical titles. So this had uh, these kind of hanging figures um, and a strobe light above it that I sort of customized. So it was almost like a road, like a, it almost looked like it was animated. Um, it was really, really hard to figure out. And these kind of creatures were just sort of floating above. And with that floating, this myth sort of came into my head that there were sort of these angels above that have existed as long as time, that every uh, sort of every age they would, they would ask who has who. And that question to me was, um, one that was part of my personal life, but it also, it started to feel really fraught and uh, kind of a difficult phrase to understand because it felt like it had everything to do with like who possesses who. And that also felt like there was a kind of societal order to that, that started to speak to an age in which we think we can have things that are beyond our having in a way. Uh, these figures that were floating above, they go through each age they'd ask this of the world and kind of the world would answer in this one condensed stone. And so each of those stones would create, uh, they put them inside of them and that would become their growing heart. It would be this sort of like bejeweled heart of stones that each of these angels had. Um, in reality, this piece was quite terrifying. It's the only piece that I think I've made that um, actually scared me in the studio because it was just flashing and seeing these beings floating there, like one after the other, they would kind of just transform was um, kind of, I mean, it was beautiful, but I, I just, it was one of the few times where I, I didn't really know what I had made. The second is sort of outside of that into a kind of purgatorial space where you would see these um, 
these globes. And I guess the circle is something that recurs both in this show and the next show, like what uh, becomes a cycle or a circle or a sphere in this show turns into the eye of the next show. These lights are a piece by Jacob Cassay. Um, I had an idea for, a custom, for these custom night lights and I remember asking Jake or telling Jake about it. Um, and he was like, oh, that's really funny. Like I've had a piece, uh, a nightlight piece that I've always wanted to show and I just never have. And he told me his idea and it was a lot better than mine. So I just asked him if I could use his instead. So these are the pieces that you see here. They're capes from super villain characters that are just turned upside down and clipped to lights. And so the orange one is the hobgoblin. Um, and oh, he's gonna kill me for not remembering the middle one. Um, damn. I wanna say Dr. Doom, but it's not, cause that's green. This is a piece by, it's a collaborative piece between me and Raphael Lyon. Um, Raphael's a bit of a mad scientist and um, this is all uh, electroformed copper. Um, and I just wanted something that was gonna disturb like the, the, the sort of seamless notion of, of everything sort of making some kind of sense. I, I wanted something that looked really, really alien in the show. Um, and then the last piece, uh, which for some reason post first is only mean his garden. So this, um, what you see in the back are there, it's, it's the, um, what am I thinking of? Uh, it's the full, it's all of the, the 12 symbols from the horoscope. So uh, you, you can find your sign somewhere in there. Um, they're either taken from, they're, they're either interpretive understandings of ancient symbols or uh, kind of updates that I've created on my own. So for instance, cancer is right in the center. And so you can kind of see that the vines become crab claws with this like giant drip in the middle. And to me, this was like the, the final rebirth, but all of what you see here, uh, that's inlaid smoked mother of pearl, uh, or rather this is specifically abalone. What I realized is that when you, <laughs> when you cold smoke abalone, uh, it turns this bright, bright yellow. So all the blues, purples, greens uh, just sort of kind of disappear and you get this, this really like ochre rich uh, material that even though it's sort of poisoned, it's beautiful. And that's inlaid into all these different kinds of skins and leather. So it's fish skin, it's manta ray skin, it's goat skin, um, just like little fragments of things that all kind of stitch together to create that background. And in a sense, like thinking of Octavia Butler's parable of the sower was also thinking that like there's this new religion to come that uh, isn't bound by the, the world we have at, in, in the moment. Um, so I'm going to go back to this show. Uh, from a very, very dissimilar place, <laughs> this show kind of arose out of um, a lot of discomforts that I had in the art world. Uh, I guess what I want to start with is, I'll just talk about the story of Odysseus and, and the Cyclops. Um, I read all those stories, but basically like, I, would, I want to just read this little part from um, June Jordan's, it's from one of June Jordan's essays. Uh, this is a great book if you don't have it. Okay, so she's gonna tell us about Polyphemus because this kind of helps a lot of things click for me. We've begun to live in the land of Polyphemus. Poor Polyphemus. He was this ugly and gigantic one-eyed cyclops who liked to smash human beings on rocks and then eat them. But one day he happened to capture the wily and very restless Ulysses, or Odysseus, who one night gave Polyphemus so much wine that the poor lunk fell into a drunken sleep. Taking advantage of his adversary's discomposure, Ulysses and a couple of his buddies seized a great stick and heated its tip in a nearby handily burning fire. When the tip was glowing hot, Ulysses and his buddies stuck that thing into the one eye of Polyphemus, twisting it deeply into that socket and blinding him. Polyphemus howled a terrible howl. He was in much pain. 
what is the name of the man who has done this to me, he cried. And the wily Ulysses answered him, my name is no one. Later, several other Cyclops raced up to Polyphemus because they had heard him howling. Who did this to you, they asked. Polyphemus screamed his accusation for the world to hear. No one has done this to me. Well, when the fellow Cyclops heard that they heard that, they decided that if no one had done this to Polyphemus, it must be the will of the gods. And it's nothing could or should be done about the blinding of Polyphemus. And so nothing was done. And after a while, Ulysses and his men escaped unnoticed by the blinded Cyclops. I share this story with you because it remains one of my favorites and because it was the only reason I stayed awake during my second year of Latin. And I tell you about Polyphemus because we seem determined to warp ourselves into itty bitty imitations of his foolishness. To repeat, the other Cyclops decided that if no one had done anything, then nothing was to be done. What happened to him represented the will of the gods. I worry about that notion of a democratic state. Do we really believe 11.5% unemployment represents God's will? Is that why the powerful say, unemployment has emerged? If that construction strikes your ear is somehow ridiculous because quite rightly it conjures up the phenomenon of unemployment as if it emerges from nowhere into nothing, then what sense do you make of this very familiar construction used very often by the powerless? I lost my job. Who in his or her right mind loses a job? What should I understand if you say something like that to me? Should I suppose that one morning you got up and drank your coffee and left the house, but then you just couldn't find your job? If that's not what anybody means, then why don't we say, GM laid off half the night shift. They fired me. Who did what to whom? Who's responsible? I'm gonna skip a bit. In our own passive ways, we frequently validate the passive voice of a powerful state that seeks to conceal the truth from us, the people. And this seems to me an okay situation only for a carnivorous idiot like Polyphemus. So that really helped a lot of things click. Um, for me, this show was kind of a way of unearthing some things that I feel like are sort of the passive voice of, uh, of what's around us as well. And to me, that's like essentially growing fascism. And when this show initially started, what I really wanted to do was, you know, this was in a space for students. So part of me wanted to show them that, um, that the arts and the art world and everything that they were going into, like there's this idea, this sort of false notion that the art world is, is um, a pure free space that you can do and say whatever you want. And it's like all liberal people that understand you and da 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 da. And it's, uh, of course it's not. It's the same world that we live in. It's, it's the same misogynistic, racist world, class, classist world that we live in. Um, it's not to say that like there aren't some incredible bright and shining things in it or people in it, um, but it was troubling to me that uh, when we talk about this democratic space, there's also ways in which that language is monopolized to allow horrible things to happen as well. And so like, to, it's as if people in power will call it a free space in order to make sure that it still remains unfree. And something about the Cyclops, it occurred to me that I had already made a Cyclops in, uh, in an earlier work where in that point I had called it American Tulpa, which is like uh, from Buddhist mythology where it's a manifestation of the mind that comes into being. And um, that was something that I was initially thinking about. I didn't think, basically it was the same thing that you see um, on the walls. Like it was a fan with a smile in front of it. The eye wasn't as articulated, it wasn't painted. It was just like a straight fan. It was almost like I was just using the fan as a device to, um, to just have the smile swinging in the air. I kind of initially was more interested in the smile and this sort of Cheshire grin that felt like it couldn't be assimilated. Like this sneer was something that was just like always haunting history. And that's what was really troubling to me, but it sort of married itself with the eye once I realized that like the fan already resembled it. And it just, I just sort of needed to cajole the life out of it in order to really start seeing that figure emerge. And so when that happened, then all of a sudden these things started to take form. And I knew that I wanted central figures 
um, I wanted like this one sort of episode in the middle or rather I, I didn't even know if, that I wanted that. I mean, it went through so many iterations. I, first it was a full bar where there's tables everywhere and there was a whole different setup. Um, and little by little, like what, um, what eventually happens in any show or in any artwork uh, for me and I think for many others is that it goes through what I would consider um, this process that brings things to the point of necessity. Um, and I think something, it's something that I'll refer to again, but like sculptural necessity is something that uh, is hard to describe. It, it's something that's internal, it's not eternal. Um, but finding that necessity and living by that necessity and allowing that sense of necessity to grow and change is kind of um, what you would consider a career. It's what like a body of work eventually becomes, what your life's work becomes. And so this is a, <laughs> the result of finding sculptural necessity where over time I started to realize that no, I didn't need the full bar. No, I didn't need all of that theater. It could be reduced to this singular moment and kind of condensed into that moment. And, um, and counterpoints became uh, available. And I realized that the figures, instead of having uh, kind of loosely articulated heads, should obviously have the same eye as the fans above them. The thing that was so nice about this space was that because it's so high, I was able to kind of structure it in a way that it's like a superstructure and base where like what is above is reflected in what is below. So kind of the way that June Jordan is talking about language and how like this uh, institutional language of the passive voice is what we all use to such an extent that we can say something as crazy as I lost my job. It's something that's implanted in us. It becomes us and we don't even know it. And it's that insidiousness that becomes the figures themselves where the, they're just participating in this larger structure of surveillance, surveilling each other and becoming a completely flattened sense of, of life that um, it just becomes this macabre messed up world. So, these fans, um, I realized that I needed something not as a sort of clear counterbalance, but um, I wanted some other figures in the room. This is a piece that uh, was from actually from another show I did in Baltimore in 2015, which I would consider like kind of a foundational show for me. Um, and the piece is called The Feast of Mau Mau, which is the title of a Screamin' Jay Hawkins song, who's a singer from the 60s. Um, it's an incredible song. It's really, really bizarre. Um, it also, I mean, the Mau Mau, they, they were, uh, um, there was the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya, which was, uh, you know, an uprising against British, the, the British uh, colonists. But, so alongside that, I think I was also interested very specifically in that song because there's something about, like you have to, you have to watch his performance of it. I mean, the song itself is kind of crazy and over the top, but his performance is also unbelievable where it's so theatrical and so like, it's as if he's aware of the process of racialization and like heightening it to such a degree that he, that he breaks it. Like it's so over the top that he like weaponizes the racial, the racialization itself. And like this process of turning things back on the other is something that I was really interested in in this show. Like for instance, the smile is something that I think about from a similar vantage point where it has multiple valences in the show, but um, there is a smile, you can smile so hard that it can become a weapon. Like you can use it uh, in a way, in a way, taking a concave gesture and turning it convex, like when you smile so hard that you start to threaten someone. And that's something that was interesting to me here. Like the smile almost 
in some ways kind of feels like this post-racial demon, like this demon that's haunting a situation where like we assume that everything's fine. It's like, no, like shit's still really not fine. And this smile is like a testament to that. It's like a sneer in the face of that. Um, and likewise, like this, this the piece, piece of Mau Mau, like <laughs> initially this frog was smiling. Uh, we're, not, we're not seeing Mau Mau. Oh, no? Oh, we're on possessions still. Oh, really? Where, what, what is it that you're seeing? We're seeing uh, the garden piece in, there you go. Now we're seeing you. Hi. <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay, so that entire time I was talking about Polyphemus, were you not seeing the show Polyphemus? Wild. I'm really sorry. I wish somebody had said something sooner. Um, okay, well, all the things that I was saying still hold. And here they are. <laughs> um, damn, I'm sorry about that. That must have been weird. Um, so this is Feast of the Mel Mel. And this was a piece like uh, I bought I bought it ready made um, from the Bombay Company, which is like a you know, you get like crappy furniture and, and things and I, I remember like going to the Bombay company and say, like they always had this serving like a serving thing um, which is like their kind of suburban riff on the Venetian blackamoor um, which was like a, usually it was like a, a, a black figure serving and I this figure as as I purchased it had a giant like a really long uh, kind of nose to it and a big smile on its face. And the shorts were obviously just like, you know, like regular shorts. So I cut, I basically like re-sculpted his entire face, removed the smile, painted his eyes, and he became a much more like in control and sinister character. And then a part of me felt like it was, it had swung too much the other direction, where right? like he was too self-possessed in a way. And uh, that, that was the moment that I decided like, well, his pants need to be down. There needs to be this sort of moment of humiliation or embarrassment alongside trying to serve up what he's serving up. And it just felt appropriate. In the back, um, Is uh, where is he? There we go. In the back is this giant monkey. Uh, this piece is called "Welcome to World Peace." Um, this is also loosely based on a story that had like that something that happened to me, where um, it was based on a caricature of me that my friends had done, where like. They were trying to, everybody was making like these caricatures and uh, stupid stuff where somebody would be on a skateboard in their underwear. Um, but in mine, they made me a monkey. And I had kept it for uh, all these years from when I was 17 to, to now. And um, over time, I realized like how like kind of messed up that is. And that my friends are and assholes also. Um, but what I got out of that was that there's like, I, I had like this sort of greaser haircut and something about that informed this piece where I, I wanted to make something that looked like uh, something you'd see at a diner or like a, a restaurant in middle America, but like have it be a trope that the monkey just could never fit into. Like he's never going to be the greaser. He's never going to be like, he's never going to fit quite right. This is all just like something that he's convinced himself of. And so the winking and him saying it's okay, um, to me was like, it's a provocation in a way to say like, do you, do you get like who the butt of the joke is? Like, do you understand? Do you know why you're laughing? Are you laughing for the right reasons? Like what side of this joke are you on? 
um, a lot of times the subject position of a joke is kind of what makes it um, funny in a particular cultural moment. So for instance, like uh, if you go back and watch 30 Rock, there's a lot of discomforting humor about race because it's centered around a white woman and her discomfort with race, not centered around the person of color um, who the joke is on. And that shift is like palpable. Like when, when uh, like for instance, like a, just off, off the bat, like the movie Lovebirds with Camille Nanjani and Issa Rae, um, a lot of the jokes, the butt of those jokes are white people. That's relatively new in, in like mainstream cinema to see, um, to see that joke land and for people to largely get it and accept it. That is a big shift in the way that we're thinking about what's funny and what's acceptably funny and what is understandably funny. So those lines are very, very important in terms of how we think about um, where we are in culture today. Um, this character, uh, piece is called Before Dawn. I don't know how many of you are familiar. Um, the publisher of Art Forum, Knight Landisman, uh, was one of the first people to, um, to have a, a sexual harassment case brought against him. Um, and uh, with tons of inappropriate behavior. Um, he was also known for exclusively wearing single color, really bright suits, specifically this orange one. So for people who know the New York art world, this like is an immediate recognition. But of course, like that's not, that's not what I want this piece to be reduced to. Um, seeing anybody in an orange suit with orange sneakers leering in the back of a bar is enough to suggest that something's not right. So obviously like it, you can't see that here, but the fan is on and so it's swinging side to side. And that's um, part of like what I wanted to create in this ocean, like sort of emotional atmosphere. Um, and I'll just show a few more pictures of the piece itself where there's clearly like an argument happening here. Initially, I wanted it more spelled out, but I think what ended up resulting is like it, it just was more interesting as a sculpture to let the viewer come to it with their own ideas and their, their own understandings of, of what could be happening here with um, one character completely distracted and um, looking at her phone, which is blank, and the other sort of really insisting that he has something important to say. Um, I don't want to take up too much more time, so I just want to kind of finish with uh, something that I've been thinking about very recently, and the reason why I wanted to show both exhibitions. Um, so I'm just going to read this because like these are new thoughts and <laughs> I don't, uh, um, it's going to suck if I try to uh, just run with it. The search for one's necessity is what you call their career. Um, uh, some people this manifests in a singular fashion. For me, I've realized how important it is uh, for me to move between projects of seemingly different natures. I think I'm generally interested in what's excluded. Um, and this is not a question that has uh, one single answer. Part of what interests me is that the world is not only a multiplicity, but our approach to the world is its own multiplicity. Just as there is an ecology of species, there is a meta ecology of how we can know the world, also known as epistemology. The study of how we know the world can sometimes be a reductive practice where the physicist sees physics all the way down, the chemist sees chemical bonds all the way down, and the linguist sees language all the way down. But it's precisely that all these species of knowing interact and live together towards a larger and deeper knowing. And I guess this deeper knowing is, you know, the funny words for it, you can call it truth, you can call it dharma, you can call it a whole number of things. 
for me, the way I work is an attempt to celebrate the diversity of our ways of knowing and hopefully, uh, and hopefully encounter new ones in my practice because uh, we have far from exhausted our ways of knowing. This means the terrible can sit beside the beautiful as long as it has gone through the lens of my necessity. So what that sort of means is my species of knowing is my necessity. And it is by definition not the same as someone else's. So I think I will end on that thought um, and leave some time for questions. Uh, there's plenty more to say about the exhibition that's at uh, Goucher, but I think that's enough for today. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I'm in the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we had a couple of questions in the chat that I saw. Um, we have one from M. Sanzi, who says, it is very apparent that you take great care to place everything just so. I'm curious about the decision regarding the glasses of wine, one full and the other just a bit left. Is this of significance? I find it intriguing when juxtaposed between the two genders. That's funny. Um, it was a relatively intuitive decision. Um, in my head, I guess it would be like the story that I have is like, when, when someone like doesn't want to drink more than one glass of wine, they'll leave just like a, a tiny bit left in the glass and they'll just like let it sit there for hours so that like there's not this empty glass sitting there it's just like enough to keep people from asking oh do you want another drink are you okay and on the other side it's like he could have gone through like seven beers by this point like who knows it's it's whatever the level of the beer it's going to be like uh he can have another That's a funny question. We also had a, a question about the book. Uh, what was the name of the book? More clearly, you were tiny when you held it up. Oh, um, the book is Some of Us Did Not Die, New and Selected Essays of June Jordan. This is it again. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Jamie. Can I? Ask him to unmute. Hi, Jamie. Did it work? There you go. He's still muted, though. He's still muted. Hey. Hey. There we go. <laughs> um, I, I wanted. I just wanted to follow on to that question because I think, it, like you holding up the book and the references of the reading, like I wonder if you could talk about how important reading and, and text is in in relation to your practice. It's something that we often touch on, and I also thought it was really interesting you reading passages as part of the talk because I think they're like very direct connections to the work. Yeah, um, thanks, that's a nice question. Um, reading is really important to me. I think it becomes part of the work when, or I mean, it's like, it's always in the background, like I'm always reading a lot of things, um, but I guess in a sense, it has to be metabolized properly. Um, so when, like when an essay like that sparks something that then becomes something else that becomes something else that like, when I can get the, like the, uh, <laughs> when I can find sort of the sculptural necessity from, uh, from those texts, then that's like where, where I, I feel like it becomes a fruitful um, exchange because 
I don't have any interest in like illustrating a text or suggesting that the work needs the text to survive. Like I prefer all of my work to just, I, I hope that anybody can walk through any show that I have and um, be left with a, you know, a, an emotional resonance that, that makes some kind of sense to them. Um, in a sense, I like to believe that like all my work could be seen by children and they'd have a, a real kick out of it. Like, I don't think there's anything that leaves the studio that I'm like, okay, so what would like my nephew think? Like if it, as long as it doesn't bore my nephew because his attention span is like pretty touch and go. Um, so to say that like, even though literature is something that's very, very important to me, it's important to me because there's such precision of feeling in it. There's such precision of feeling history and culture in it that allows me to translate things in a way that I find a lot easier than like looking to sculpture or looking to other art. It's, I, I don't, I don't get, the sustenance I get from other visual artists is not like what I end up using for my own work. It's just like, I just love visual art. And so I'll, I'll experience that, but it's not, it's different than literature. To me. Um, we have a question from Daisy Johnson, uh, Goucher class of 2007. She says, uh, I hope, uh, I love how your show is simultaneously about breakup and global warming. Uh, what do you think is the role of art and myths during existential crisis, both personal and global? Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I think... I guess I would say that as long as we're talking about art in the wider sense, like as long as we're talking about art in terms of just like culture at large. Like I think that there's so many ways in which these conversations can uh, continue to create different ways of thinking about these issues, these problems. Like if we're looking at what TV can do, what movies can do, what literature can do, what articles and magazines can do. Um, visual art plays is part of that ecology. Like it's, it's part of how I can contribute and how um, to me, what I think visual art does well is like it, it allows you to have visual art and literature both do well. It's like it allows for conflicting things to be presented simultaneously um, where there's distance from it. So like in life, there's always conflicting things that are happening. There's always um, complicated amalgams of ideas uh, that are are just being thrown at you all the time. But when you have the distance and somewhat somewhat more clarity to just like look at an artwork and see how it's functioning, see like, okay, so this is, uh, this is working this way. What does that mean for me? How does that make me feel? How does that make me think about the world? Uh, what does that uncover for me? Then I think that does become like part of how we sort of inch forward. I don't think art is, um, I don't think we should confuse art for activism. Like I think uh, artists are citizens as much as they're artists. So if you are part of a society, like if you're, if you're part of the world, then you owe it to yourself to also do the things that a citizen would do, which is um, have conversations with your family, go and vote, understand what your districts are, like understand who is doing what and why. Um, you're not absolved from that as an artist and uh, you're not, above it either you're not in some private sphere like everything that we are doing is for others like we're not doing this in some you know like masturbatory like effect it's it's um it's social from the start so if you accept that it's social then your ways of participating in the world aren't just simply to be an artist it's like you have to live your life as well It can also provide a lot of peace and healing. I think that's the other thing I would say. Like, uh, I think art does provide a, a substantial space to, for like repose and, and care. And, um, and that's, a, that's really, really necessary right now.
Um, there are another couple of questions in the chat. Um, one from David Hart. Uh, so could you talk a little about mouths and smiles? They seem to be a symbol that carries throughout your work. The LED smiling white supremacist, the dog missing his mouth. Um, and you mentioned reshaping the mouth of the dog at the Goucher show. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's like something that's just continuing to grow and change. Like, I don't know if I know the boundaries of it just yet. Um, I know that it's, it's a, that sneer is something that feels, I guess I, what I can say about it is that it's something that feels unassimilable. Like I don't, I don't know exactly how else to, to put it, um, and that kind of joy and disgust and hate and passion all feel kind of contained in that smile. Um, I guess like there's also this uh, this moment in a, a interview with James Baldwin where he's talking about the invention of the n-word and like he knows that he's not one and that it's like an invention that white people created and if it's your own invention why did you need it in the first place and so kind of at the end of that clip he sort of serves it back to them it's like a, please like have this back and figure out your own shit um and that's kind of how I feel about the smile. There's like something about it that feels like this is um, something being served back. Uh, we also have another one from Avery who says, uh, curious about the use of two polyphemuses or polyphemous characters at the bar. Was there a consideration to incorporate a character that was an innocent at the bar? Why or why not? Um, no, no one's innocent. <laughs> um, uh, that actually, so that brings up the title of the piece. Um, it's called The Citizens because, like, there's a lot of retellings of the story of the Cyclops. Um, you know, Jude Jordan recounts that, but um, Derek Walcott has his own version. Um, and uh, James Joyce has his own version in Ulysses. Um, where instead of getting the Cyclops like drunk in his cave, it happens in a much more natural setting in Ireland, which is at the bar. And uh, at the bar, the, the, the Cyclops character is um, a man just named the Citizen. And he's just this horrible, xenophobic, anti-Semitic asshole of a man. Um, and uh, he just has, you know, he's like this sort of dictatorial fascistic figure that's trying to like just uh, assert his presence as much as possible. So to call them, I wanted to call it the citizens because it's, I don't want it to be singular. It's not singular and um, it's, uh, it's bigger than that. Other questions? Doesn't look like it. Cool. Right. If there's also just like any like material questions or things like that. Um, How did you melt those gummy bears? Oh, uh, in a crock pot. Cool. <laughs> Basically, the reason why it just like it works really well um, to create that sort of like molten planetary effect. It, it was like it. I stumbled upon it in like a much earlier work in like 2013 where I was making this globe and I, part of it was like, I wanted to be made up like gelatin. Like I, I, that was important. I, I've used a lot of candy in my work too. So candy is also something that's like recurs from time to time. Um, and uh, I painted it with like this, this gummy bear mess. And then when I painted it, like I painted it with acrylic paint after that and the gummy bears are still setting. So the acrylic paint just starts to tear in a way that looks quite like planetary. 
or like tectonic. Um, and I'm going to ask this just because I feel like I've got to see a lot of it, but how, how did the exhibition change between March and, and August? Oh my God. Um, so much. It would have been a bad show if it happened on time. Uh, so timing, you know, timing works in, in like nice ways. Uh, like the horrible pandemic side, like I'm I, not, that, <laughs> not that I wish any of that, but um, you know, I, I'm, I'm in a way glad that I have more time with all of this work. And um, I think the major thing that changed is that initially, like a lot of, I, when I have made figurative work in the past, they're, they can be kind of beat up or like they're, they're not, they're not trying to like look real in any sense. Like they, I can take a lot of liberties with the way that I, I create figures and sometimes to make them look specifically janky is like part of it. That's how these kind of started. Like I was thinking like the female figure was almost going to be just like shoulders and like two metal sticks. And, um, and then I started draping the clothes and like none of it, it just felt, it didn't feel right at all. It also felt like the more reality I gave them, the creepier and more uncanny the whole experience was and the more insidious it felt like that this, this wasn't some um, cobbled together made up space, but it was almost dear space and that just felt like a it it just it meant that it needed more time because like i needed to actually like those figures are not mannequins like they're they're very very specifically created so when you really spend some time looking at them um <clears throat> their posture is like relatively natural but there's also things that can't happen in real life like my studio mate um i'm just gonna i'm gonna share my screen again just to show you this one one bit um, my studio mates marble carver so he has like great facility with the human figure um, and he was specifically like I was just asking I kind of like ran it past him like do these look believable and he's like yeah they look great and he's like but are you going to fix the spine in the guy and I was like what are you, what are you talking about and he was like, nobody's spine like buckles in like that. Like there's an actual spine there. And I was like, oh, no, but I, I need it to be sunken like that. Like it has to be, it has to look like he's kind of puckering his body in kind of this like whiny ass way. That's like the tone that it needs to set. So like, it's perfect that it looks like he's spineless. That's, <laughs> that's who that person is. Um, and similarly, you can't actually see this in the pictures, but like her legs, like they cut a silhouette um, that looks believable. But when you see her from the side, uh, the back of her legs are sculpted when full roundness. The front of her legs are completely flat. So it becomes like this sort of haptic image where um, it has a body, but it also flattens into an image. And that was just like something that happened in the making of it, where I was like, oh, I want it to be these two things at once. Like I want her to, being that contradiction. Anyone else? I have a question that's not material related. Is that okay? <laughs> Please. Um, I was also interested in your mention of personal catastrophe in relation to global catastrophe. And I was wondering if you could expand a bit more on that and how they're in conversation with one another if one takes precedence or one informs the other more in your work um i think i just start with what i intimately know so um when i read something there's there's things that even though I feel passionate about or like there's things that I see in the world that even though I feel passionate about, if I can't find my place in it, 
in terms of like a subject position that makes some kind of sense to me, then it may not be my material to take on. Um, there are other people that can do that. Um, that's great. Um, so it, it just becomes like an easy litmus test to run it through the, the space of the personal, um, not because it has to be about me. Like, I don't think there's any, almost, almost anything that you would see that you would necessarily be like, oh, this is pretty biographical. Like it, it, you don't read biography immediately. Um, but it's just, I think there are ways of establishing intimacy. And I think intimacy in, in sculpture and like the way that I think about work is something that um, is important to me and like changing, especially using sculpture to change your orientation towards things. Like if you're looking into something, there's a sense of wonder and that can like, uh, that can short circuit some protections that we have for when we're used to looking at art in a particular way that when you see something that draws you in and it's like, it's meant to look kind of, uh, it's, it's meant to have some wonder to it. It's meant to disarm you. Then you can also do some more discomforting things in that space too. Um, that level of intimacy usually stems from thinking about like things that are very, very personal and specific to myself and then kind of treating it as material and thinking, okay, well, like, what is this, what is this outside of me now? And does this connect to a larger current? And most of the time, I'll find that it does. It, not because like, I'm searching, like it, it just sort of, it happens relatively naturally. Like it's a lot of trial and error. Like I'll try things, for instance, that dog, like the, the dog with the broken face. Um, I found out on the street when I was living at a friend's apartment, um, like in the middle of my breakup, it was broken exactly like that. The legs were broken, the face was ripped off. And I was like, God damn, like what happened to this thing? And I was like, well, this is clearly my companion for the time being. So I just brought it home. And um, I had it in the studio for the longest time. I take that back. I had it in the back of my car for the longest time, then the studio. And it didn't amount to anything for so long. Like it, I, everything I tried to do to it, I was like, this is like, this is, super corny and it just didn't make any sense and then um finally like that phrase who has who and like how that was also like a, a personal like vestige of something and like it all just made sense um and it was in realizing that the phrase was not for me anymore like it was it had a, a wider significance and that kind of like it was freeing in a way i was like oh this is a really strange thing to say to someone. Um, and uh, it kind of like, it all just started connecting from there. One, one more, anyone? Or should we wrap it up? All right. Cool. Thank you, Adam. Sure. It's my pleasure. And thank um, you to everyone who, who sat through and wish we could see you all <laughs> or have a reception. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, thanks everyone for everybody who turned out and um, thanks for listening. Um, it is very strange to talk with nobody looking at you so uh i'm sorry if, it, if i was weird at any point but this is like a super bizarre experience for us all yeah <laughs> all right all right well bye bye